Um, always a difficult act to follow, but a pleasant one. I'll try um, to do my best. I think the topic is going to be um, very similar, actually, um, uh, but possibly presented in a more, let's call it, academic or philosophical way. From my, let's call it, philosophical perspective, for better or worse, I'm not an historian, one of the deepest ways to think of the hijacking of memory is to resist for a moment talking about memory at all and talk instead about the hijacking of reason. The hijacking of reason not through memory, but through a particular comm um, commemoration techniques or particular commemoration methods. And to do that, it is useful to begin by saying a word about Jürgen Habermas. Habermas is a thinker who did more than any other in this country to salvage the notion, the notion of reason. That is, to recover from the ruins of the Third Reich the authority of reason in its universalist, Kantian, enlightened significance, and to be sure I'm a friend of these terms and think that we ought to defend them, but oftentimes we need to defend them not from their enemies, but from their alleged friends. Habermas' maneuver was twofold. First, rehabilitating reason's authority by developing discourse ethics. And second, he defended constitutional patriotism. And the two are intimately related to one another. Free public speaking was recovered in Germany as the only way to defend universal rationality that goes to discourse ethics and to the Kantian idea of reason as essentially public. And by the same token, the standards of liberal citizenship, neutral constitution, and international law were to be accepted as the only sources of legitimacy in Germany. Both of this, discourse ethics and constitutional patriotism, were meant to replace German national identity, the German we, as a ground of legitimate political norms. If you now ask, what is the reason for this commitment to abstract universal reason as a replacement of German national identity or German national consciousness, the answer is the following. The singularity of the Holocaust. The uniqueness of German's crime. In other words, memory is a reason, and again, a particular interpretation of that memory. By the way, that was the essential point of the original historical type of the mid-80s. The heart of the debate was not really the Holocaust singularity, as some people now tend to suggest. It was rather defending its singularity to prevent the instrumentalization of memory for the sake of a renewed German national identity. But this was in the mid-80s, when we were all young and naive. I was in first grade. It's become clear in the meantime, I think, that the singularity thesis itself can be instrumentalized to attack reason, undermine, undermine constitutional patriotism, and universalism. This creates what we might call, and I'm not using this overblown term, um, well, I'm using these overblown terms even though um, um, uh, it is overblown, I think it, um, it is adequate. It creates what we may call a dialectic of singularity. The idea that the Holocaust cannot be compared to other crimes was defended to argue against German national identity. It is now used to defend it. To be sure, sorry, to recover it, right? So I, I'll read it again. The idea that the Holocaust cannot be compared to other crimes was defended to argue against German national identity. It is now used to recover it. And to be sure, this does not mean that the singularity thesis is false or necessarily has to be abandoned. I'm not entering that here. But it does mean that in order to defend reason and international law, the singularity thesis must meet the scrutiny of critique. Those who defend or those who are out to defend universalism in the German and American newspapers from post-colonialism or critical race theory should have welcomed this insistence on critique. It is a Kantian idea if there ever was any. But for some reason, whenever a critique of singularity and its dialectic is offered, it faces charges 
of anti-Semitism. And when Germany's commitment to Israel enters the equation in public debates, the authority of reason blows up almost completely. The commitment to reason was generated out of the memory of Germany's past, but what happens when Israel, as a reason of state, enters that equation? How does Germany's commitment to the Jewish state as a Staatsraison tackle the authority of public discourse and of constitutional patriotism as replacements of German national identity? To begin to answer that question, it is worth returning again to Habermas. As some people here would remember, when in 2012 he was asked by Haaretz, the Israeli daily, of his evaluation of Israeli politics, he refused to comment. His answer was, and this is now a quote, it is not the business of a private German citizen of my generation to offer an opinion. Now I've commented on this answer elsewhere at length, and it is not my intention to speak about this here yet again, only to say the following as a necessary background. As a private citizen, Habermas' stance is obviously understandable, but that's besides the point. The point is that Habermas is not a private German citizen. When the public intellectual par excellence seeks refuge in privacy, when the founder of discourse ethics as the answer to Germany's past refuses to speak, there are significant theoretical and political consequences. The self-censorship, this self-censorship, as in the most technical sense of the term, located Israel, a reason of state, outside of the authority of reason. There is almost a teleological suspension of the ethical for Israel, if you understand Habermas's position on what reason is, essentially public discourse. The stance of which this silence is a symbolic grand gesture, has severe consequences, and over the years it has spoken for many German intellectuals, including those who belong to much younger generations. The result, I believe, has been the breakdown of public rational discussion. It's also the moment through which German national identity enters again in the back door, and that's something that I'd like to return to in a moment. Now, the common challenge to what I'm saying here seems obvious. It's repeated often um, against my position, and it is important to tackle it here directly. It goes like this. Is Israel not conscious, constantly and repeatedly criticized in Germany? There's even a term for this practice, right? This is something that's raised often. There's even the term Israel critique. There's hardly a censorship of the conversation, and therefore not a censorship of reason. I think this is very misleading. There's a lot of shouting about Israel, but the silence of serious intellectuals on the basic issues has created a situation in which the fundamental terms necessary for a rational discussion have been, sorry, undermined. The integrity of basic universalist principles have been hijacked by the authority of memory. Basic rational principles have been delegitimized as inherently anti-Semitic. And by the way, we know the same trend from post-colonial and other post-enlightenment critics today, the tendency to denounce reason and universalism as inherently racist. In fact, I would argue that one reason why the current clashes between post-colonial critics and Zionists are so violent is that the two trends are rather similar to each other. Both sides oppose enlightenment, universalism, as inherently racist and violent and posit identity instead. But I'm drifting. Back to the thread, the minimal standards of what counts as liberal democracy, namely state neutrality, strongly suggests that a Jewish and democratic state is a contradiction in terms. I submit that this is an obvious fact that should be clear to every political scientist or a political philosopher German, Israeli, or other, for the simple reason that sovereignty that is based on ethnicity or the ethnicity of one group 
rather than on citizenship as such, cannot be democratic. Israel is a state of the Jewish people rather than of its citizens as such, cannot treat non-Jews as equal political subjects. Far from it. For that reason, the situation within Israel cannot be described, as often it is described, as one of systematic discrimination, familiar from all democracies. It is rather one of legal discrimination on the basis of ethnicity as part of the very concept of the state. But whereas the standard that I'm stating here is obvious in every liberal context, when it applies to Israel and Germany, this minimal standard is not just rejected, questioned, or debated, it is presented as anti-Semitic. And it has been presented as anti-Semitic years before the Bundestag's BDS Beschluss made it officially so. So I want to say a word on the BDS Beschluss, I'm going to skip here a comment on the amnesty report for time, and then I'd like to um, return to the new right. So first, the Bundestag's BDS Beschluss. It specifies that Israel's Existenzrecht is Staatsräson in Germany, and denounces those who question it as anti-Semitic. Now, the Beschluss claims to rely on the IRA's working definition of anti-Semitism, a problematic document in its own right, but I don't know if this is surprises anyone, I'm going for the moment to actually endorse it. I'm going to accept it for the sake of argument. According to this walking definition, whereas criticism of Israel is not as such anti-Semitic, denying the Jewish people the, quote, right to self-determination is anti-Semitic, as is applying to the country, quote, double standards, criticizing it by criteria that are, quote, not demanded of any other democratic nation, end quote. One great advantage of the IRAD formulation is that it defines anti-Semitism in non-exclusionary way. It is possible to interpret the Jews' right to self-determination as the existence of a Jewish state, but IRA actually remains ambiguous on the question of whether this is the only interpretation of that clause. IRA does not exclude the possibility that Israel should not be a state, um, that Israel should be the state of all its citizens, that is, not a Jewish state, and it leaves wide open the ability to interpret national self-determination also as a right to an autonomy or a federative multinational constellation without a Jewish state. That's exactly the situation that the Bundestag's Beschluss put on its head. Pretending to draw on IRA's interpretation of anti-Semitism, its main function was actually to revise it, trans transform the definition from its ambiguous, non-exclusionary account to an exclusionary one. Where IRA carefully speaks of the right of Jews to self-determination, the Bundestag is careful to speak of Israel's, quote, right of existence as a Jewish and democratic state. Whoever denies that is anti-Semitic and is to be excluded from public funding, public speaking, and so forth. Much like some post-colonial trends, uh, post trends then, the Bundestag, voicing its opinion only in opinion, not legislation, labels the main liberal principle, the Jeffersonian idea of state neutrality, as racist. Sorry, anti-Semitic. Now, it would have been comfortable for Germans, but not for Palestinians, and not for Israelis, if this attack on the idea of liberal democracy could be contained to the Holy Land. But it can't be. There is a dialectic of singularity at play, and it now returns to undermine Germany's own commitment to constitutional patriotism, rehabilitating German national identity as the origin of political norms. If being German requires being responsible to the Holocaust's past, and I believe that it should be, then responsibility to the past cannot entail accepting discrimination against Palestinians or anyone. Quite simply, 
If being German requires giving up on the self-evident truth that all humans are equal, then in that case, Palestinians, Muslims, Arabs, people of the global south, as people say, can hardly be German, and this is now just the point, the same goes to Jews, white people, and all humans who still believe and are committed to equality. The idea, the idea that you need to accept and defend the Jewish and democratic formula in order to do justice to German past is actually a violent attack on universalism embodied through constitutional patriotism. When authors in Die Welt, Fatz, Die Zeit, worry nowadays of the post-colonial attacks on universalism, they more often than not join a growing trend, complaining of the attacks on universalism as the most comfortable way to avoid uncomfortable universalist commitments. Now this, ten this tendency is not, not yet, an expression of the hijacking of memory by the right. It is rather the hijacking of the center to the right by a particular form of commemoration. But to be sure, the same dialectical logic does return, and I think with a vengeance, also to support Germany's new and radical right if denying the Jewish and democratic formula is anti-Semitic, an anti-Semitic double standard, is not liberals attack on the IFDES legitimacy, an anti-Semitic attack on Israel's right to exist? Two years ago, Yair Netanyahu, the son of the then prime minister, tweeted, this is a quote, the EU is an enemy of Israel. Schengen is dead. Hopefully the globalist EU will be too. Then Europe will be again free, democratic, and Christian, end quote. It isn't surprising that the IFD was enthusiastic about Netanyahu's tweet. The fantasy to liberate Europe from liberal democracy and let it be Christian again is the aspiration to reinstantiate an anti-liberal order, one to which Muslim citizens and Jewish citizens can perhaps belong, but then as much as Palestinian citizens of Israel belong in a Jewish state. Joachim Kuss, a IFD representative who served then as a member of the European Parliament, tweeted in response to Netanyahu's tweet, a poster of Yair Netanyahu's picture echoing in big letters his slogan for a quote, free, democratic, and Christian Germany. And at least since the Tivoli program of 1892, such affirmations of a Christian Germany carry a clear anti-Semitic connotation since they seek an ethnocentric ethno state that is free of Jewish influence, that's a quote from the program, and clearly, the IFD and Netanyahu Jr. are interested here mostly in the liberation of Germany from Muslim influence, not Jewish influence, but the transference of the same logic to Jews would hardly disturb them. Both positions here can actually agree, IFD and Netanyahu, that Jews should ideally live in their own Jewish state. The IFD's subtext is clear. Does Israel have the right to be Jewish and democratic? Of course it does. Denying this is anti-Semitic. But then, how can it be legitimate for Germans to hope for the exact same? Why shouldn't Germans embrace Israel model and define their country as Christian and democratic in an ethnic and cultural sense, not a religious one, just like Israel? The IFD and Netanyahu agree that they should but we're making ourselves an easy life when we speak here of the IFD and of Netanyahu. Can you please tell me what a David Grossman, Amos Oz, Yehuda Bauer, Saul Friedlander, Aaron Barak, Moshe Halbertal say about this? And can we please hear not what the radical post-colonialists would say about this, but what a Habermas would say in return? If not a Habermas, perhaps members of Germany's younger intellectual generation? As long as the Bundestag's official position is that it's anti-Semitic to deny the idea of a Jewish democracy, the Bundestag seems very open, not to say committed,
to the idea of a Christian and democratic Germany. Unless, of course, it is willing in this case to apply a double standard. Thank you very much.